us that admission of powerlessness. I can't control it. I've made promises to myself to stop, to slow down. I've made promises to my loved ones, and I've not been able to keep my promises because we have compulsion. We have obsession, you know, with our addictions. Our brains, if you will, have been programmed to use our addictions as ways of dealing with our anxieties, dealing with our stressors. And so it's almost like we, we've lost control. Not almost, we have lost control. And then our lives have become unmanageable. We find ourselves doing things that we would never have done before. You know, for example, um, you know, if we're drinking and driving, we're, we, we are at risk for getting a DUI, for a charge of driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And if we get a DUI, you know, then the, your insurance goes up, you may get legal consequences to that. And, and, and so things that you would never imagine that you would do or you're drunk and you take a woman home, you pick up a woman at the bar and you take her you know, to a hotel room or home and, you know, or, or you do that and you would never have done it before, but, but you're married and, and your marriage falls apart as a result of it. There are all of those negative consequences that, that happen, physical illnesses, you know, um, for example, uh, alcohol is correlated with a higher rate of diabetes um, or um, not just legal consequences, but you might lose your job or you might lose your family as a result of it. All kinds of, of negative consequences occur as a result of, of doing things that we would not normally do. That's what we mean by our lives have become unmanageable. And so coming to admit that is, is, is the, probably the biggest, biggest struggle that we have, that we're, we're powerless. And it really is a process unto itself. In other words, you know, we might come to one level of realizing our powerlessness. But as we continue working the steps, we come back to that step repeatedly and we see deeper ways as God gives us insight into our own brokenness, into ourselves, deeper ways that we, we really don't trust God, that we still need to be in charge of our own lives and how broken that we've become as the result of that. Now, when we come to that place of admitting it, um, here, we, here we have scripture that are related to the steps. Now, I, I want to make a comment about this now as we're beginning this. There are recovery Bibles that I would love to recommend to you. The one I use is the Serenity Bible. It has all kinds of beautiful thoughts in the Bible about each of the steps. And the steps are, you know, each of their meditations are correlated with scriptures. And there are many scriptures, many, many scriptures that relate to each of the steps. What we've done here for the purposes of this presentation is choose one of them. And for step one, we've chosen, you know, the familiar passage of Romans chapter 7, verse 18. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have de the desire to do what is good, but cannot carry it out. So these kind of scriptures, and again, a recovery Bible has many scriptures, as I mentioned. There are other Bibles like the recovery Bible or the life recovery Bible. All you need to do is Google recovery Bibles and many different options will come for you. And again, as you're working through the program, having a recovery Bible is a is a marvelous tool to use as a part of your recovery Bible, because when you do your Bible studies, you can focus on where you actually are in working the program um, in, in terms of the steps for yourself. And so I would strongly recommend, please, if you're serious about working a program of recovery, 
please get a recovery Bible for yourself of one kind or another. The chapter in the book Steps to Christ is chapter two correlated with step one, the sinner's need of Christ. You know, we think that we can do life by ourselves, that we're okay by ourselves. But when we come to the end of ourselves, when we come to, to seeing that, you know, we can't manage our lives anymore, that we can get off this elevator of craziness by pushing the button at any, any floor we want to, we come to see that we have a real need for Jesus, that we don't want to do life by ourselves anymore. Not just that we can't, but we come to the place of, of falling in love with this Jesus and saying, I don't want to do life anymore by myself. And so that is a great day when we come to that place. So step two says, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So what is sanity? Okay. One of the things that we describe sanity as in the 12 step program is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different result. But we know that that we if we continue using our addiction, we're going to get the same results, the same self destructive um, uh, results, the same destructive results with other people. And, and so this whole idea of sanity is sanitus, Latin for health. God's going to restore us to healthy thinking and even to, to physical health when we stop our addictions. It's going to be a, a, a complete and total redo of our spiritual, physical, emotional, and mental health. It, it's, this is a comprehensive approach to, to restoration. And so step two says, we came to believe. And what that implies is that coming to believe is a process. And it, it's a beautiful process because when we believe, we're talking here not just about cognitive belief in a, in a God that can restore us uh, to sanity, a power greater than ourselves, but it is a, an internal heart trusting of this God. God can do for me what I can't do for myself. Okay, he can do for me what I can't do for myself. So, so this process is first we came. And what that means is we start coming to meetings, to 12 step meetings, and we start listening to what the speakers and the other members of that group are sharing. And so in, in our meetings, what we do is we, we have usually we have a series of introductory um, passages that we read, you know, um, um, welcome, how it works, and then we recite the 12 steps. And then usually the person who's assigned to lead the meeting for that night or that day, whenever the meeting is, um, begins by, by sharing a thought about the particular step that you're working on for that day. And then everyone in the group is open to sharing about that particular step or something that really is important for them that day. And so when we come to the meetings, we start opening ourselves up and we start listening and we start learning and we learn things like, wow, I'm not alone. There are other people in this meeting that are struggling with the same things or very similar things that I am struggling with. And, and then we listen, well, this is how they've begun overcoming that thing. And it's like, oh my, they're overcoming that. And, and how, how are they overcoming it? And we start listening and learning, and then we can begin putting these things into effect ourselves. So first we came to the meetings, then we came to, just like the prodigal son, he, he found himself in the pig pen feeding pigs. And he said, oh my goodness, my father's house, if I even go back there, I, I'll have something to eat. I'll have a place to sleep. He, he came to, he came to realizations and we come to those same realizations. And then we come to believe or trust that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. 
it is a it is a a beautiful powerful thing to come to that realization that i can't manage but god can manage my life and so here we take a look at scriptures like isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 that says so don't be do not fear for i am with you don't be dismayed for i am your god I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What a beautiful promise that we find here. And, and again, if I were working this step and I were reading that Bible promise, you know, I would say to myself, God, you're with me. And, and because you're with me, I'm learning not to be afraid anymore. I'm learning not to be anxious because, Lord, I'm not in control of my life anymore. I don't want to be in control of my life. You are my God, and you've promised to strengthen me. You've promised to help me and, and to hold me up and, and carry me, you know, with your strong right hand. You know, I would apply that scripture that way to myself in recovery, and I have done that so many times. The corresponding chapter in the book Steps to Christ is the chapter on repentance. And that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful chapter on our need to, to come to the end of ourselves, to repent, and to see honestly what our brokenness and our sinfulness has been. And then to say, no, Lord, I, I've, I've run my own life, and in doing that, I've, I've sinned. And Lord, I, I'm telling you that you're not enough. But now, Lord, I'm telling you that you are enough for me. So that's some thoughts on the second step. The third step, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. And Jesus Christ is our higher, highest power. And so this is a very conscious decision that we make. Okay? See, you can't turn your will and life over to the care of God until you've come, come to see that you can no longer control your life and, that, and, and have hope and confidence that God can. And so here then, we make this decision to turn our will, our deciding power, our choice power. You know, some people have described in the literature um, our will, uh, addiction as a disability of the will. In other words, our capacity to choose has been damaged through our addictions. You know, um, and, and so here, once we find some sobriety, we find that we can choose now to turn our will, at least as much as we're able to at this moment, over to God. And you know what? Here's, here's some wonderful news I want to share. You know, God starts with you where you are. He doesn't demand perfection of you. You know, he, 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 the program talks about progress, not perfection. And so if all you have is a little bit of will, you know, just a basic decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understood him, he starts with right where you are. And then later on, as you continue working the steps, it's like peeling an onion and you'll go deeper and deeper and deeper in your capacity to surrender your will and your whole life. God, I'm yours. Do with me what you see fit right now. Not my will, but thine be done. The same that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so we come to the place of deeper and deeper surrender as time goes on in our journey. So, and so remember, Jesus loves you. He cares about you. He's passionately pursuing you. And, and that pursuit is to the point where you are going to be able to be secure in the love of God and then make this decision to surrender your will and your life to the care of God. So, in, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verse 23, we read, Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. 
a beautiful reminder connected to uh, step three that, um, you know, I have to deny myself, you know, I want to come after you. I want to follow you, Lord. I've run my life myself and now I'm going to deny myself and I'm going to choose now to follow you, Lord, wherever that means. Taking up the cross does not mean, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to have to take up a cross of, of recovery, I mean, of, of suffering necessarily, but a cross of whatever, Lord, you permit in my life from here on. I'm trusting that you're going to, you're, you're going to be leading. And if it, if it is suffering, great. But if it's joy, if it's victory, you know, that you have for me, Lord, I will, I'll follow wherever you lead. And here in Steps to Christ, the beautiful chapter, chapter four on confession, you know, um, and, uh, and, and so that confessing to God, our love for him and our commitment to him by turning our will and lives over to the care of God. Step four, in many people's lives who work the 12 step programs, this step is perhaps the most difficult step. But I want to say this to you, that people who courageously take step four and, and again, uh, take step four often, as often as you're working through the 12 steps, um, this is the greatest step of growth. Growth comes here, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. I want to suggest this, that that this searching and fearless moral inventory is something that we should write. Now, one of the things that we know from research is that is that often the things that we use as addictions, whether it's pornography, whether it's food, whether it's whether it's alcohol, drugs, whether it's being in control, whether it's codependency, you know, whatever our addictions may happen to be, media, a lot of people in COVID-19, you know, are, are, are media addicts now, you know, they've, they've kind of gotten their stress um, medicated with that. But whatever they are, Often what they are are coping mechanisms. We've learned that through research, that our addictions are often coping mechanisms to deal with stress, to deal with abuse, to deal with trauma. And we know, we know from research that often those kinds of stressors, abuse and trauma occurs very early in life. Um, and and we try to do whatever we can. We try to be in control. We try to perform to earn God's love. You know, we try to do many, many things. We, you know, we take on identities like that of a victim, or we fight to survive, or we run from conflict to survive. We do all of those things because we're simply trying to survive the pain of life as we've experienced it. And so doing a searching and fearless moral inventory, it's almost, it starts by writing out your story. This, this is the story of my life as it's unfolded. It's still being written even now, but up until this time, this has been the story of my life. These are the hurts, the wounds that have that have um, happened in my life. These are the positive things, the experiences of love that I have that I've had in my life. These are my strengths. These are my limitations. These are the things that I've done that have really um, hurt me and hurt other people and and made um, you know uh, gaps in my relationships with other people. It's a searching and fearless moral inventory of my life. This is how I've responded with bitterness or resentment. These are the things that I've done that have hurt me. These are the things that um, that uh, I, I do now that I'm trying to do to recover. And so this is where we are honest with ourselves about the course of our lives. And often we suggest doing this these kind of inventory steps and all of the steps with a person that we call a sponsor, you know, someone who's worked the steps ahead of us and who can guide us in our steps. So looking at our resentments, looking at our fears, all of those kinds of things are, are things that are a part of step four. And again, it's searching and fearless. It doesn't mean we don't have any fears, but it means I'm working through my fears 
to write out all of these these things. C can you see how that that can result in the greatest growth? Because we're really being honest with ourselves, perhaps for the very first time in our lives, about um, what we have done, what has been done to us, and and how life has been for us. And so. It, the book of Lamentations says, let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. And so here again, steps to Christ chapter four, the same, you know, we're here, we're confessing to ourselves, we're confessing to God, you know, we're being honest about ourselves in a searching and fearless way. We've written it all out and it's been a blessing to us as hard as it's been. Then the next step is we admitted to God, to ourselves and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. And here, the, the first, we're, we're first and foremost accountable to God. And we say, God, this is me. You know, so many of us have a kind of a cognitive faith. You know, we have all these wonderful concepts that we've learned in our beautiful Adventist doctrines. You know, we, we've learned cognitive ideas. And, and now we're, we're doing more than that. We're being honest with God about things that we've done, things that have hurt us. You know, in other words, we do our fifth step, first of all, with God. And, and so we talk with God about what we discovered in our fourth step, okay? We admit that to God. God, I'm broken. This is what I've done. I've hurt people. I've hurt myself. You know, uh, I, I have really given you messages that, that talk about your inadequacy as God. I've been my own God, Lord. You know, we, we admit all of that to God. You know, and I would recommend reading your story that you've written. Read out your, your fourth step to God, you know, and, and to ourselves. You know, we're honest with ourselves for the first time, perhaps. You know, boy, you know, this is deeper than I thought it was. And I know in my own life, as I keep working the steps, God just keeps taking me deeper and deeper into my, into showing me my brokenness and deeper ways in which showing me, David, you don't fully trust me yet, do you? And I have to say to God and to myself, oh God, you're right, I don't. You know, and and then we admit them to another human being. You know, sometimes we might share about these things in some of our meetings that are that are uh, confidential. You know, whatever's said in the meeting stays in the meeting. It's a safe place for us to be honest, to be open, and to be real with other human beings. But when we talk about the fullness of our of our uh, fifth step, you know, we we want to find someone who is safe, whether it's our sponsor, whether it might be a pastor, could be a counselor, a therapist, you know, that we, we share our fifth step with, you know, someone who's worked the program longer than we are, that we respect as who will keep our confidentiality. You know, we have this beautiful thought, you know, confess your faults one to another this, and pray for one another that you may be healed. And so when we when we confess our faults to another human being and we find them, you know, safe, they're not condemning us, they're not beating us up, they're not telling us what a rotten human being we are, you know, but we've shared them, shared with them, then it, it, it just, it's like lifting a heavy weight off, off of our shoulders and just taking that and leaving it with God. It's like casting all of this into the sea of forgetfulness. And so in the chapter to, to, to chapter four in Steps to Christ, again, relates to the same step uh, of confession, okay? And again, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And, and so when, when we have someone praying for us after we've shared with them, it, it's such a, a healing, healing thing. I've heard many people's fifth steps, both professionally and personally in the program, and it's been a wonderful thing just to watch the relief that comes to them. Well, step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. You know, this, this process of becoming entirely ready, you know, God, you know, I've relied upon all these things for so long, 
God, now I'm asking you to remove them. I, I found that you are stronger than any of my attempts you know, to, to manage my own life. I see them now as defects of character. And so now, Lord, I have become entirely ready to have you remove, you know, remove these defects of character. And if you're willing and obedient, Isaiah 1, 119 says, you will eat the best from the land. And so here we have the chapter on consecration. So we're consecrating our lives now to God in a whole new way. And so moving on, we move to the seventh step. This is a step of humility. You know, God, I can't fix myself is basically what we're saying here. I can't fix myself, but God, I humbly acknowledge that you can remove all my shortcomings, all the defects of character that I've identified in my, you know, through working the steps to this point. Lord, I'm asking that you remove all of my shortcomings, God. And here, you know, humble yourselves. James 4, 10 says, before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And here we have, you know, chapter 6 in the book, Steps to Christ, the chapter on faith and acceptance. And we've, we've integrated some of these thoughts into chapter 6 of the book, Steps to Christ in the Recovery Edition. So humble yourselves before God and ask him to remove your shortcomings. Step eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Oh my goodness. So here we ask you to write it out again. Made a list of all everyone you've harmed. How have I harmed people? Okay, and became willing to make amends to them all. This is, this is really, really important. I'm, my job is to be willing, okay? For example, what if, what if someone died? You know, I'm willing to make amends to them, but I can't because they're no longer here, right? Or I've lost contact with them. You know, I'm willing to do it, you know, but there are situations in which I can't. And I'm going to talk about that more in the next step. So, so Matthew 5.23 Leave your gift here in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. And so this is really, really important. This is a, an attempt to reconcile, to go to people, you know, and to be willing to say to them, look, I hurt you as in the process of my addiction. The first person we hurt is who? Ourselves. Then we've hurt our family members. And then there may be other people, you know, on the job or at church or whatever it is who we have hurt through our addiction. And so it's becoming willing to make amends to them. And so here, the chapter in the book Steps to Christ is the step is a test of discipleship. Step nine, we may direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. And so this is a very important caveat that we have, except when to do so would injure them or others. For example, let's say that when you were very, very, very young, you, you made out you know, with a, a young lady in the backseat of your car. And, and now she's accepted Jesus. She's grown into this woman who loves God. She's married, has children. And if you were to go to her door, even if you could find her, knock on her door and say, you know, I had sex with you, remember, in the backseat of the car? You know, you know, that's probably something that would not be helpful to her, helpful to her marriage, you know, at this particular time. So we need to be wise, not as a way of excusing or making, you know, I don't want to tell people, so I'm not going to go to them. But when we're honest with ourselves and maybe in consultation with our sponsor, you know, should I go to this person and make amends? I'm willing to, you know, it's not that I'm not willing to, but am I going to hurt them or not hurt them in that process? So Luke chapter 6, verse 38 says, given it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. It will be poured into your lap for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so, again, I'm, I'm, my heart's open to the people I've hurt, including the way I've hurt myself. And I'm trying to make amends to make things right. 
And again, Steps to Christ, Chapter 8, this is about a way of growing up into Christ. Step 10, we continued to take personal inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. And so here, you know, we did step four, which is the inventory of our whole lives. But what this step does is at the end of each day, or even as things are happening during the course of the day, when we see that we've hurt someone, we promptly admit it. And we go to them and say, you know what? I'm sorry. I, I didn't need to use that tone of voice with you. Or I'm sorry, you know, I really, I really didn't take you into account when I made that decision. You know, we, we take a daily inventory and promptly admit when we have hurt someone else. And again, Romans 12, verse 3, 4, by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. And at the Steps to Christ chapter, chapter 9, is the work and the life. And then step 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And so here, this is, this is you know, this is all, the steps are a journey to Christ. You know, they're a journey to intimacy and connection with him. wrote words, but we're, we're meditating, we're developing an intimate, discipled relationship with God. We've fallen in love with God. And so we're praying now, now God, what do you want from me? And, and give me the strength to carry out your will for me just today, just today. And so Psalm 19, 14 says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And here we have steps to Christ chapters 10, 11, and 12. And finally, we have step 12. Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. In other words, we've, we've, we've now developed intimacy with God. Now the steps become a way of life for us. And this love that we have for God, we're trying to tell everyone about it. Come, join me on this journey of sanctification, of character development, of growth into a deeper love of God. And so these principles now become integrated into every single aspect of our life, into our work experience, into our family experience, into our, our church religious experience, into our personal spiritual lives with God. We want, they become way a way of life for us. And so now Galatians 6, 1 says, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch for your, watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. And now we're in chapter 13, rejoicing in the Lord in the book Steps to Christ. So what I want to do now is I'm going to stop sharing and um, I'm going to ask Katya to come and take us through questions that you may have that we can answer now for the remaining time. Thank you so much, David. And uh, that was a wonderful uh, explanation of how we can actually uh, use the steps in our own experience, as well as how we can be helpful uh, for anyone struggling, whether it is addictions, compulsions, or sinful tendencies. And it brings hope that it is part of our, our journey. So um, I see here there are a couple of people with their hands up. I would ask you, if you don't mind, to please type. You can see below the screen, on the Zoom screen, there is a, a Q&A um, area there. You just click there, and then you can type your question that you have. Unfortunately, we cannot open a, the audio to, to listen to your question, but you can type. And we'll be very happy to um, to answer them. There were several questions in here, and one of them I uh, tried to answer them as you were speaking, uh, David, to some mm -hmm. of them that are more technical. But one of the question was uh, how we would recommend advertising for this addiction recovery uh, for for an addiction recovery program in a way that people will feel will feel comfortable attending. 
Oh, that's that's a great question, Katya. Um, one of the things that that we try to do, we have a weekly newsletter, and we put you know the a Zoom link and the times and dates you know of our twelve step meeting at our church. And by the way, our meeting has been running now every week for about nine to ten years. And so it's been a stable meeting, you know, and but we put it in our newsletter. That's one thing that we do, our church newsletter. We we try to advertise it, you know, through um, um, the NAD and GC websites, you know, so people can look on those websites and see where there might be meetings. And, and so that's another way of doing it. Um, we try to make it also known through um, various you know, like Facebook and, you know, our, our own ministry websites, you know, we try to encourage people to to spread the word about it. You know, with Zoom now, what we've discovered is that people join our meeting from around the country, even around the world. We've had people from, you know, coming coming to our, our little meeting right here, you know, in in uh, in Michigan. So so it's really it, you know, there are many ways of doing it. Some, by the way, some newspapers even allow in the free advertising section, they do advertise 12 step meetings. And you just could advertise that this is a Christ Center 12 step meeting, to, you know, time and place or Zoom link or whatever it is, and get some free advertising that way. Sometimes even probation offices, you know, when people get DUIs or have alcohol related offenses, they want their people to attend a 12 step meeting. And we've had referrals from probation officers from the courts, you know, coming to our meetings as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. We I was mentioning to them as well that uh, really the best advertising for these meetings are not so much what's in the paper, although all of this can be helpful, but really is the people who are coming as word of mouth. Is yes. as they experience being there and, and being helped, you know, helped by that group they will invite others and so around the world what we're seeing is that the best way to advertise it is really uh the people who are part of it so uh, that really is is one of the powerful ways but all these other ways can be helpful of course in some places um people have a difficulty because they think oh it's, it's just for people with substance abuse you know it's not for me but in reality um it's really a program about growth and it's about the meetings are about restoration for mental, emotional, uh, traumatic events, as well as other compulsions that all of us have. So it's really for everyone. And so uh, re removing that stigma or that notion is, is helpful as you think of uh, advertising it in, in those ways. There's another question here. Um, is this book available in Thai? I think they're referring to the Steps to Christ. Uh, and this Steps to Christ uh, Recovery Edition was a, a project of the General Conference. And so uh, we have started with the Safelis um, Publishing House in Europe, which made it available in French, Spanish, and English. And, and that was then sold. This was when it was launched uh, for divisions around the world who wanted it. The North American division purchased a huge amount. And so I put it in the answer uh, in, on the link here. Uh, on the Q&A, uh, the link to where you can go to to find the three languages, how to order it uh, online for, you know, in the North American division territory, I think they also ship it to Inter-American other places. But there are other divisions that have it. The NSD, which I mean, the SSD, which is where Thailand is, um, they have it in English uh, in some forms there, but I, it's not yet translated uh, into Thai. However, um, anyone in this call who wishes, who is from a different country, uh, a different division, and wishes to have this book, please email us at recovery at um, gc.evanis.org. And <clears throat> I place the link in, in an answer there for someone else. And I'll answer you here as well. That way you can connect with us and then we can connect with the local division to see. Some divisions are currently translating it. I know that the ESD, the SAD, and other divisions are currently working on translating this to make it available. So hopefully it will be available in Thai soon. Uh, another question here, how, um, what about someone who would love to join the recovery pro program, how they can do it? <laughs> Mm -hmm. David, I don't know if you want to talk about it, and then I can talk about the training. Uh, sure, sure. For, for people who simply want to attend, 
you know, you don't have to be screened. It's a, you know, our meetings are open meetings. So anyone who wants to come is, is w very, very welcome to, to attend. And again, you don't even, you're not required to say anything. You can just be quiet until you feel safe enough to, to open up and, and to share your own story or journey or why you're there or whatever. So it is, it is not a closed meeting, it's an open meeting. You simply have to find the location and whether it's a Zoom location or a face-to-face -face location and just come. Yes, indeed. And as you mentioned, uh, place there are some places that are offering on um, online, and uh, we are currently holding another online meeting that I'm um, helping facilitate in, in Portugal. And and you know some countries are doing this online. So again, if you want to find out which meetings are happening where, uh, if you are in NAD, you can go to nadhealth.org. Uh, if you are outside the NAD in any other country and other divisions, um, you can go to uh, AdventistRecoveryGlobal.org and contact with us there. Um, and I will uh, type the, 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 the website here again. Um, that way we can try to connect you with your local division directors where meetings are. Now, if you want to attend the meeting and become a facilitator, then um, there is a facilitator training available for people uh, and usually that's where many of the meetings begin with a group of uh, people who attend the training and they start a short group and then they, uh, you know, uh, begin this ministry. And so we offer facilitator trainings uh, around the world for those in NAD. Again, you go to nadhealth.org. But for those outside NAD, uh, you can contact us at adventistrecoveryglobal.org and uh, we will be able to connect with you with future trainings or even um start uh planning for a training if you don't have one currently assigned another question katya yes, i want to mention on training is the nad now has developed a uh, an online training option yeah so, that's what we're doing to globally so yeah, yeah. uh-huh yeah. it's an excellent option for those in nad to do it online and then through other countries also we're doing uh, virtual training so yeah during this pandemic that's the way we can do it it's not mm -hmm. as 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 well as good i think as in person but certainly it has been helpful hasn't it to be able to do it through mm -hmm. technology okay so another question is there an ebook available currently um there from what i understand there's no ebooks these are printed books i think there is a, a, a safelis is planning to to have it as an ebook it's in the works uh the steps to christ recovery edition so uh, again, if you uh, go to the website, if that is, becomes available, it will be listed there as an option. Um, there is another question here. Uh, what about some, um, no, uh, is it necessarily to be an overcomer of some kind of addiction in order to mentor someone through this 12 steps? Excellent question, David. Well, and the answer is no. Um, absolutely no. You can, you know, the facilitator training, you know, is is open to anyone who is interested. However, I want to just say something to you. In my experience, when we really let the Holy Spirit search our hearts, every one of us is addicted to something. You know, if nothing else, we're addicted to sin. And, and so I think we can apply the steps even if we don't identify with, you know, a serious addiction, but there are process addictions, there are many different kinds of addictions. And I think we can all readily uh, ap apply the steps to our own lives. And I think it's best for people who are actually working the program for themselves to mentor other people through it as facilitators. But no, you don't have to be an addict to alcohol or drugs, for example, to facilitate. That's correct. What we do usually recommend, right, David, is that people, the, the, the requirement is that people uh, become familiar with this material and work yeah. through their own recovery, as you mentioned. And yes. so using the materials themselves uh, before uh, they can help someone, it's, it's very critical. And we do recommend that for those that wish to begin a group like this, it, it's critical that you take the facilitator training so that you can really um, see how to hold a, and host a program and and really how to use it first in your life and then you can share with others. Another question here, David, um, 
how long is the entire 12 steps program if I want to hold it in my church? Oh, okay. In other words, how long do you do it? Well, <clears throat> what, you know, the way the, the participant guides are structured, um, you work through each of the steps for a month, okay? And so you work through the whole 12 step program over the course of a year, and then you start all over again with step one and you work through the steps for another year and you keep doing it. And, and what happens is, I, this is the ideal, <clears throat> is that the Holy Spirit takes you deeper and deeper and more deeply into looking at your own heart. I mean, I'm getting insights even now and I've been working a 12 step program for probably 45 years and the Holy Spirit's taking me more and more deeply and showing me, oh, you know, some of the things that I never knew were there and and why they were there and where they come from. And it's like, OK, thank you, God. And so it, it, it kind of depends. There are people who come, they work the program for a while. And and when they think they're done, they stop coming to the meeting, you know. But ideally, you know, this work of sanctification, of character development is the work, according to spirit of prophecy, of a lifetime. So that's right. I look I tend to look at it that way. That is so true. So uh, for you um, who is trying to do it in your church, uh, people sometimes think, oh, this is a program. It, it will begin and end at a certain time. What we recommend when we do trainings, and I've done like uh, three or four trainings for even specific churches that wanted to do this um, in various divisions this time. Um, what we're saying is that they can plan at least for a year, that that's how long it takes for people to use all the materials provided. The, we have in the, in the facilitator manual, all the meetings that you can host weekly for a whole year. And then after that, of course, the idea is to continue as David is saying. So you can you reuse the materials and go through the steps again by using other materials as well. And, and so it's not one of those programs that you're gonna begin and then in three months, so five months, it will be over. We hope that this is something you will offer continuously um, for the reasons that uh, David mentioned. Um, another question here um, about watching a replay of this. Uh, what we will do, we will have the videos uh, of many of these uh, health-related presentations. In this case, uh, we will request for this one as well to be posted on our website, healthministries.com. Uh, and there is a video library there. All the under events, all the the sessions that were recorded that have to do with ministries and health, uh, we can post it there. But certainly the camp meeting will also have these videos uh, on the camp meeting website that you can rewatch it uh, and replay it. And um, do we have a sample of a curriculum of the program for one year? Uh, this is something we share during the training. What you can know if you go again uh, in our training page, and uh, I will answer here quickly. Uh, go to AdventistRecoveryGlobal.org, uh, and then you will go under Get Involved, and there's trainings there. There's an explanation, kind of like a summary of what is in the training in regard to this. But in terms of the curriculum of the program, we go through the 12 steps. It's a very in-depth uh, uh, kind of search of that. Right, David? So it's hard. It's not just a curriculum. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about it so they can know? Well yeah, the other thing that I would mention is that there is um, not just a participant guide, but there's a facilitator's guide that walks you through in each in detail uh, a, a format for each week. That's right. It's over so, the course of a year. And so it is very well laid out, you know, so that even if you're a, even if you're you've gone through the training but never attended meetings before 12 step meetings, here it is laid out for you for each week. So you don't have to be afraid. I don't know how to do this. Yeah. And our time is up. So this could end at any moment now. It has been wonderful being with you. Thank you, David. And if you do have any more questions, please just reach out to us at Adventist Recovery uh, Global uh, website. There's a connect or just email recovery at gc.adventist.org if you have questions about training and some of these things that we mentioned. And David's email, I think, is sedlacek uh, at ngews.edu, right, uh, David? That's correct. Mm -hmm. If you uh, also want to ask him a direct question. And uh, we're looking forward to, to see 
every church, right, David, have a 12-step right. program okay. like this around the world. That would be a dream. Uh, I will try to uh, answer another question. If we still have time, I know they're going to end this at any moment. And so maybe 